A number of early philosophers debated what is meant by art. Do we mean by art what the artist has in his mind? Or is it the actual manual activity of the artist? Or do we mean by art the finished art object? The early church fathers rejected all three, saying, no, the credit must go to God, for he made the artist. The question is even more complicated, yet more interesting, when the subject is music. The ancient Greeks separated music from the other arts, primarily because music alone among them cannot be seen. This caused them to classify painting as a craft, but music as something divine. Certainly, music is something different from a painting. A painting is a past tense completed object hanging on a wall, whereas music only exists in live performance in the present tense. For this reason, a painting is a noun, but music is a verb. A painting can be owned by an individual, but no one owns Mozart. It is for these reasons alone that music must be treated separately from painting and sculpture. But for the world of the conductor, there is another distinction, having to do with the means and the end. Michelangelo, it is clear from the comments of his contemporaries, considered art to be in the artist's head, and that the finished artwork was a representation of this. In between these two lay months of laborious work which was necessary, but of little importance in comparison with the other two. And we, as observers of art, are not particularly interested in the means, only the end. In music, the means is the rehearsal process. In earlier times, because they had more power, conductors took advantage of the means, often requiring great amounts of rehearsal time. I know of a rehearsal where the conductor spent two hours on the first five bars of a march. There is something fundamentally wrong with the philosophy of such conductors. These conductors were devoting themselves to the rehearsal of the details they saw on paper. But there is no music on the paper, only the grammar of music. Even worse, they regarded the rehearsal time as a time for work and only the concert as a time for making music. At the first rehearsal of the 1967 season with the Philadelphia Orchestra, Eugene Ormandy was rehearsing Bruckner's Symphony No. 4. With nothing more than a brief welcome to new members, Ormandy began with the first movement and there was no break for more than 20 minutes. A young observer, still in his 20s and very inexperienced, was sitting there wondering when he would begin to rehearse. He was eager to observe his rehearsal technique. When the orchestra stopped, William Smith, the associate conductor, leaned over and said, "Ah, uh, it sure ruins a good rehearsal to have to stop. So how should you rehearse? Firstly, you must realise that the students in the ensemble probably already have more technique than is required for most of their band music. And assuming there are no errors in the parts, they can probably quickly learn the notes in rehearsal without further comment. Secondly, the conductor must remember that the students are there because they love music and they love to play. Any time spent in lecturing them on the grammar of music will turn them off. What the students need and what should be the point of the rehearsal is the music which is not found on paper. Remember, there are no symbols for the emotions on paper. The conductor knows from score study what the composer was trying to communicate in terms of feeling. The purpose of the rehearsal is to bring into alignment the music heard in the room with the music heard in the conductor's head. If this is the goal, then all rehearsals, even the first one, will consist of music making. And as a bonus, you get to hear and have those wonderful musical experiences over and over again, and not just once in the concert. <laughs>